AJC has been a partner in defining the relationship between American Jews and Israel and a leader in strengthening that relationship. We're trying to do something a little different. We're trying to model the kind of agreeable disagreement that ultimately can bring people closer together around issues where it's not just about the theater of the moment, it's about the significance of the outcome. Good morning and welcome. My name is David Inlander and I am proud to be the chair of AJC's Interreligious Affairs Commission. The essence of AJC's interfaith work is that we never shy away from a worthy challenge. And arguably, what we have here this morning in this plenary session is the most important interfaith challenge of our time. Muslim-Jewish relations. AJC was the Jewish pioneer in transforming Catholic-Jewish relations from one of centuries of despair into the closest of friendships. This was certainly evident in the remarkable way that AJC leadership was recently received in Rome at a private, with a private audience with Pope Francis. You heard a little about that last night in the plenary session. The Muslim-Jewish relationship was never as theologically chronic as the Christian-Jewish relationship, yet, sadly, it has been poisoned in modern times by politics. But if we could overcome the Christian teaching of contempt towards the Jews that prevailed just 50 years ago, we hope that with the same vigor and commitment, we can overcome prejudice and suspicion between Muslims and Jews today. AJC already has a proud record in this field, and today we are redoubling our efforts. Our AJC offices, notably in Detroit, have built impressive bridges of understanding with local Muslim communities. And of course, in the international arena, no Jewish organization has more extensive contacts and interfaith standing in the Muslim world than AJC. In addition, Access, AJC's Young Leadership Division, has also made Muslim-Jewish dialogue a major priority. Indeed, it was a key theme of the Access Summit, a gathering of almost 500 young Jewish leaders from around the world, which was held just prior to the start of this AJC Global Forum. We do all of this knowing that if we're able to get this right, that is the Muslim-Jewish relationship, it will unlock a world of potential we can only begin to imagine. But we know this requires patience and determination. Our speakers today know that better than anyone. Each of them represents a, a voice of moral courage from the Muslim world and a commitment to Muslim-Jewish cooperation. Mustafa Akiol is a Turkish political commentator and author who writes regularly for leading international publications. He also is an alumnus of AJC's Project Interchange mission to Israel. Mustafa traveled from Istanbul especially to be here with us today. Urshad Manji, a self-described reformist Muslim, is a professor at NYU and the founder and director of the Moral Courage Project. Oprah Winfrey bestowed upon Irshad the first annual Chutzpah Award. <laughs> you didn't know that about Oprah, did you? <laughs> uh, the award for audacity, nerve, boldness, and conviction. And Dr. Naif Al-Mutawa is the creator of The 99, the first group of comic superheroes born of Islamic archetype. Please turn your attention to the screens behind me to watch a short video. Thank you very much. If one does not want religion to be part of the problem, 
then one must empower the religiously responsible voices and ensure that religion is part of the solution, advancing a spirit of cooperation and mutual respect. Thank you and good morning. It's really a privilege to be present at the AJC second time in a decade. I was here 10 years ago again, another beautiful meeting like this. And I went to, AJ, went to Israel with AJC again 10 years ago and had the honor and privilege of uh, meeting Rabbi Rosen there. Uh, but let me share you an experience of mine that even goes back beyond that two decades ago, in early 90s, in Turkey, Istanbul, where I live. It was my college years. I was, I think, in the third or fourth year. I came across a book uh, which was titled Israel's Sacred War. I said, what is that? Well, this was a book which claimed that the Israeli-Palestinian conflict on the Israeli side is driven by B biblical commandments, particularly Leviticus and Book of Joshua. It quoted some belligerent passages and said, this is what drives them, the Jews, the Israelis. It also quoted a rabbi named Mayor Kahane, who had pretty extremist views. And, and it said, this is what they think. This is what they believe. I didn't know much about Israel and Palestine then. I didn't know much about Israel society. So I said, wow. Over the years, I took classes about the Middle East. I took classes about Israeli society. And I realized that what that book presented as a mainstream voice in Judaism was a very extreme voice, which was condemned by the overwhelming majority of Jews. I realized that well, that view was considered as a terrorist view in the U.S., and it was forbidden. And that particular literal understanding of uh, the Jewish scriptures was a very marginal view. And I realized that this was not a book that gave me facts about Israel. This was a book that gave me propaganda, anti-Semitic propaganda. And I realized that we should not be misled in our part of the world by such propaganda and see the Israel society within its diversity. And the propaganda was basically looking at very few extremist voices and extrapolating from them and to conclude that they actually represent a larger whole. Now, why I'm telling you the story? The story is that, first of all, I was misled when I read that you know, anti-Semitic literature for a while. Then I learned better, of course. But I also saw similar approaches in the past decade in the West some anti-Islamic anti voices this time, which focus on some extremist voices in the Muslim world, and then extrapolated from them and to say that this is what they think, this is what their scripture say. Well, admittedly, we do have extremists, and they are much more prominent than you know, the very small group of Jewish extremists in, in, in Israel today. Uh, we have a problem with those people but they necessarily do not represent the core values of Islam, our faith, and they should not be taken as the true representative of Islam. Their literal understanding of some of the belligerent passages of the Quran is not shared by the overwhelming majority of Muslims who see those narratives as historical narratives, not 
not literal commandments that is actually relevant for today. I'm someone who speaks both to Western and Eastern audiences all the time, Muslim audiences and Western audiences. And I, every time I speak, I try to underline that the extremists are blinding us and making us think that they define the other civilization, the other side. These stereotypes are creating an image, and we should go beyond that image. If we go beyond that image, what we will see? Well, first of all, we will see that Jews and Muslims have some tensions in the modern world today. But these tensions come mainly from the issue of Israel and Palestine, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. But is this a religious conflict? No, it's a conflict over land. It's a land dispute. Here are two nations claiming the same land. One happens to be predominantly Muslim, the Palestinians. But not all of them, some of them are Christian. And it's a national issue that they have with, with that land. And Israelis, of course, uh, because of their forefathers and, and their need for a, a nation state after the Holocaust and all the horrors in, in, the, in Europe, uh, claim a land and they, they established Israel, which should remain in security and peace. But that land dispute has blinded millions in our part of the world and led them to have an anti-Semitic rhetoric, unfortunately. That's a that's an attitude that's prevalent in our part of the world. That's an attitude that we should stand. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do with my writings. But when we go beyond this land dispute, beyond this political dispute, when we look at Judaism and Islam as two religions, what we will see? Well, we will see two things. First, these are religions that are actually very similar to each other in many ways. And secondly, they actually had a pretty good history until the 20th century. Why they are similar? Well, Islam, like Judaism, is a religion that is based on Abrahamic monotheism. The belief in one God, the God of Abraham, is also the basis of Islam. The God, in both religions, God is transcendent, and God has given us a law to follow, the halakha or the sharia. And of course, how to interpret that, how, how literally to interpret that has been you know, discussed by the followers of both religions. Abraham is so central to Islam. Uh, you just saw in the clip the Kaaba, the cubicle shaped building in Mecca. Uh, you know, we Muslims go there, we turn around it, we pray. I had a chance to do that with my wife like a year ago. Do you know why we do that? You know why Kaaba is sacred? Because we believe it was built by Abraham and Ishmael, not Isaac, but Ishmael, the other son. And that's why it's sacred for Muslims. It, was a, it had turned into a pagan pantheon before Islam, and Islam reclaimed monotheism and re-established re Kaaba as a monotheistic temple rather than the pagan temple that it had become. Both religions, as I said, also have this idea of a divine law and... and also, this divine law has practical implications like kosher or halal. Uh, both religions think that males, male believers of the religion, should have circumcision. Uh, and because of these, pec these peculiarities, Muslims and Jews actually sometimes come together in the West to defend their right to have male circumcision or have koshers, kosher food and kosher meat. In Europe today, for example, you can see Muslim and Jewish communities in Germany, for example, lobbying together to uh, defend their rights to have these uh, practices continued. So if you could leave Israel and Palestine as a political issue for one minute, we would see that we have so many commonalities in that, in that religious ground. The other thing, I said Jews and Muslims had a pretty good history. What do I mean by that? Islam was born in 7th century Arabia, during the time of Prophet Muhammad. And there were Jews in Arabia at the time. And when Prophet Muhammad fled from Mecca, from pagan persecution, to Medina, what did he do, what did he do there? Some Islamists will tell you, he founded an Islamist state, that's why we should have Islamic republics or kingdoms in the world today. But actually, he signed a treaty with the Jews of Medina, which is now called the Charter of the, or the Constitution of Medina. 
in which it said to Muslims their religion, to Jews their religion. This was a pluralist entity formed under the Prophet uh, in Medina in the middle of the 7th century. The charter collapsed because of political troubles, but the idea that Jews have the right to practice their religion under the rule of Islam continued in Islamic law. And that's why when Jews were persecuted in Catholic medieval Europe, they often came to the Muslim world to find safe heaven. Uh, in Istanbul, where I live, we have a Jewish community which origin is in Spain. It's the Sephardic community. They speak Latino, the, uh, the language of the Sephardic Jews in Spain. They came to the Ottoman Empire because they were persecuted in uh, medieval Catholic uh, Europe. They were forced to either, either convert to Catholicism or to leave at the time that Columbus set sail. They came to the Ottoman Empire because they had the right to be Jews and without any disruption or any enmity. Uh, that's why throughout the centuries, Jews in the Ottoman Empire remained loyal to the Ottoman Empire and remained supportive of the empire. They were more concerned about the Balkan nationalists, for example, when the Balkan nationalists had wars against the empire. Uh, and they were, because at the time, until the 20th century, anti-Semitism was a disease of Europe, not, not the Muslim Middle East. Uh, it is notable, for example, when the blood libel first, was, first came to the, uh, this notorious stupid libel against the Jews, which began in uh, Catholic Europe, it came to the Middle East in 1840 for the first time to Damascus with Catholic missionaries who at the time were not very liberal, you know, uh, in some of their attitudes. The Ottoman Sultan Abdulaziz had an edict condemning the blood libel and saying that his Jewish subjects should not be disrupted by nonsense like this. That edict is still in the Istanbul Jewish uh, Cultural History Museum, uh, which is, you know, in one of the downtown areas in Istanbul. When we look at these things, the commonalities and the good history, it is really unfortunate that a political tension in the Middle East has pitted Muslims and Jews against each other uh, time and again, sometimes in the modern world. My argument as a fellow Muslim is that, first, we should do everything in our hand to solve that political problem, to create a peaceful solution, a two-state solution in my view, uh, in which that Israel can be safe and secure in its borders and the Palestinians can also have a dignified state in which they can be happy and focus on raising their children and building their society. And we should have a, have a, have a, uh, find a way to uh, stop that bloodshed and that it continued uh, tension in the Middle East. But besides that, we should discover our commonalities. I, as a Muslim, even think that we Muslims can learn a few things from the Jews. Like what? I think the Jewish experience with modernity is very interesting. When Jews faced modernity, the Enlightenment from the 18th century is on. Some Jews said, we will keep our tradition as it is. They became the ultra-Orthodox Jews. Some said, we will reform it to some extent, modern Orthodox. Some said maybe more reformed the conservatives. They're now reformed Jews who are reformed Jews. That diversity created an amazing, I think, plurality within Judaism. I think that is the way that Muslims will go through in the 21st century. Uh, the idea of a halakha or sharia, a divine law, how to understand that? Will we understand that as we understood exactly in the Middle Ages? or will we understand the meaning of it and transform it in the modern age? That is a very good question, and I really find a lot of interesting ideas when I read this Jewish approaches to this issue, which will come up, uh, which is coming up in the Muslim world again. Today we will listen to Irshad and her reformist arguments, which I also share to a great extent. We will see that is it, there's a different way of understanding Islam. And one thing we should be always careful is not to be misled by stereotypes, as I was, I admit, misled by stereotypes when I was 20 years old and read that anti-Semitic book, but I learned better later. And uh, in the uh, Western world today, after 9-11, some stereotypes emerge about Islam as well. We should go beyond them. And when we go beyond them, trust me, we will first realize that we have very similar fates because we all believe in the same God, as the Quran constantly emphasizes. 
And we all really are the children of Abraham. Many thanks for your attention. Shalom. Shalom. Salam. Salam. And to the atheists in this audience, how the hell are you? <laughs> I'm going to come back to the atheists in a moment, all right? Um, for those who are expecting to hear about my reformist argument for Islam, we may need to wait until the sit down, because actually, what I want to do in my few minutes alone up on this stage is tell you about the journey I've taken over the past decade. Very, very personal journey, and it's rather surprising implications for all of us. Let me start at the start. Some of you know this, but well worth re refreshing your memory. Uh, my family and I come from Uganda in East Africa. We were booted out in the early 1970s by General Idi Amin Dada. And uh, as political refugees, my family and I wound up in Canada, God bless its soil, and that is where I grew up attending two types of schools. The regular secular public school of most North American kids, and then on top of that, every Saturday for several hours at a stretch, the Islamic religious school, the madrasa. And that's where I began asking what I thought were simple, but apparently became highly inconvenient questions. For example, why can't women lead congregational prayer? Where, where is there a verse in the Quran about that? There isn't. Uh, and why, I asked at the tender age of 14 to my madrasa teacher, why can't Muslims take Jews and Christians as friends. After all, my best teachers at public school, one was an evangelical Christian who never had to evangelize to me because he lived his faith in his deeds, and another was a secular Jew, my debate coach. Yes, you can blame it on him. <laughs> so why can't we take Jews and, uh, and Christians as friends? Well, at that point, my madrasa teacher blew his top uh, having been asked more than a few questions by me over the last number of years, and he warned me, look, either you believe or you get out. And if you get out, get out for good. Well, in that nanosecond that I had to decide what I was going to do, my conscience asked me, Irshad, what are you being ordered to believe? What he's telling you does not match at all with your reality. So you have to question it. And if that means getting out of the madrasa, then that is what you have to do, girl. And that's exactly what I did do. I walked out, and my mortified mother <laughs> had to be reminded by me that, Ma, just because I've left the madrasa does not mean I have left Allah. She didn't get it back then. Boy, does she get it now. And uh, over the next several years, pre-Google days, I will add, here's why that's important, since I was no longer welcome at the madrasa, I spent the hours that I would have been there every Saturday, I now spent at the public library, reading everything I could, not just about Islam, but about religions, cultures, and belief systems. And that is when I came across this marvelous tradition of independent thinking within Islam that, David's right, politics, and only politics, has shut down. Well, 2001 happened, September 11th to be precise, and that is when I knew I had to write the book that had been percolating in me ever since I was booted out of the madrasa. The book became The Trouble with Islam Today, A Muslim's Call for Reform in Her Faith. And it launched me on what I thought was going to be a few book tours, but it became a global, decade-long conversation. And you'll hear in a moment what some of the comments I got uh, from young people were about. 
But you all know, you all know because the media has played this up big time, that during those tours, fatwas came my way, death threats came my way. Since then, 10 years on, I'm here to report to you that something very different is happening. Last year, I did a major debate on Al Jazeera TV with a conservative Muslim. And afterwards, yes, I got hate mail, but I also got what I call love bombs, a lot of them, from young Muslims all over the world who wanted to see more of that kind of debate and dialogue. And here's the most surprising part. Not a single death threat. Not one. That's progress. <laughs> it's kooky, but it's progress. You know who I am getting a lot of hate from these days? Missionary atheists who call me things like coward, who tell me in deeply vitriolic terms, which I won't share with you on this stage, but who tell me that even sticking with faith is but a fairy tale. And to them, I'm a hypocrite because I preach independent thinking on the one hand and yet am immersed in my love of God on the other. What I'm learning from this experience is that it is so easy for any of us to lapse into tribalism and insularity and, yes, irrationality, even as some of us preach rationality, for example, as atheists do. And um, I have to say to them, and I have, that they, too, need moral courage. Moral courage is speaking truth to power, but here's the key. The power, ladies and gentlemen, is not simply in Tehran, and it's not simply on Capitol Hill. The power is also in here, in our own selves, with our egos, the very source of these rigid notions of identity that compel us to cling to this idea that I and I alone have truth. You know, in so many ways, it was young people of faith, including young Jews, who pointed out to me in this global conversation during my book tours that I had a lack of moral courage. You see, they would often say to me, Irshad, understand, it's not just the trouble with Muslims. We're seeing a rise of dogmatism in our own communities, in our Hindu, in our Jewish, in our Eastern Orthodox communities. And you know what I did? I dismissed them. I cringed. My ego didn't want to hear their truth. After all, I had a thesis to uphold. I had books to sell. Well, a decade on, we're seeing chauvinism, cultural, religious, ideological chauvinism in the ascent in places like India, Russia, and yes, Israel. And with, with rising chauvinism comes defensiveness even among those who don't share that chauvinism. It's amazing, you know, every time I talk publicly about the rise of gender segregation among Jews in Israel, I'm often told to mind my own business. This from non-Muslims, who would be the first to applaud when I condemn gender segregation among Muslims. And so they need to learn moral courage. They need to speak truth to power. That is to say, to their own egos. 
As the Quran tells us, God does not change the condition of a people until they change what is inside themselves. And Muslims continue to have to hear this. We still need to hear this big time. In my experience, ladies and gentlemen, a new generation is increasingly hearing this. The question I have is, are we hearing that generation? Or are we still stuck in our post-9-11 moment? In other words, is the Viagra of identity politics keeping our emotional defenses up? Thank you very much. Good morning. So I make mistakes, we've all made mistakes as, as people, as parents, but I want to share with you a mistake that my parents made in 1979. You see, my conservative Arab Muslim parents put me on an airplane and accidentally sent me to a Jewish summer camp in New Hampshire. <laughs> you can't make this stuff up, guys. It took me six years to figure it out. I was the only one that didn't eat pork, okay? But by the time... <laughs> so I decided not to tell them. Um, and I, I continued going to camp, and now my own sons actually go there. And I told, I told camp management, I said, you know, you should probably change the name from Camp Robin Hood to Camp Robin Yehud. At least then <laughs> you get an indication as to what's going on. So let's go back further into history. I want to talk to you a little bit about the second commandment that God gave to Moses as, as a pivot for what I'm trying to do within the Muslim world. So, you know, religion's no dummy. Religion's always been suspect about the use of art because before monotheism, people were worshipping art. They were worshipping idols. But why is it that in the Western world, things are a bit loose when it comes to that, whereas in the Muslim world, things are still pretty uptight when it comes to it? I think the, the secret has to do with language and, and its evolution. So let's go back to, to the to the thousand years in which Latin was the language of religion in, in, in Europe, over the course of the century after century, vulgar Latin evolved, right? The, the language that was poo-pooed upon, what became French and Italian and Spanish, that was not what real people spoke. Real people spoke Latin. And as less and less people were able to con culturally contribute, what you had was an extremism of thought, which led to the, you know, the Catholic Church's um, extremism back in the 14th and 15th century. But what happened to change that is King Henry, who really, 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 really wanted that divorce, to translate the Bible into English, Martin Luther into German, and all of a sudden Europe woke up. Europe woke up because finally the language they thought in matched the language they spoke in, matched the language they wrote in. Meanwhile, the Arab world went to sleep. Every prophet came to his people with a miracle. The prophet Moses could turn a stick into a snake because the discourse during ancient Egypt at the time was that of magic. But the prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came to a Mecca rife with poetry and prose. So his miracle was the language in which the Quran came in. So if your miracle is language, and language evolves, what do you do? What we did as a culture is we came up with all kinds of rules to freeze the language from evolution and thereby disconnected the language of thought and the language of speaking. So to this day, kids learn in school in Arabic, they don't actually understand when they come back home. My son came back with five words put into sentences. I knew none. He was in fourth grade. I called my mother who taught philosophy in the Arabic language for 30 years. She knew two of the five. Right? So, what, so basically we're beating it out and, it was, and we're disconnecting the relationship between language and thought. And the long-term repercussions of that is you have 80% of Muslims who pray in a language they don't understand. And that leaves the power into the hands of those who are doing the interpretations. So I, t you know, I took these thoughts and went to a bunch of investors back in 2003 and I said, listen. I said, if you look at the superheroes that exist in the world today, they're based on biblical archetypes. Like the prophets, all the superheroes are missing parents. Batman's parents die when he's six. Spider-Man's raised by an uncle. Superman's parents die in Krypton. And all of them, like the prophets, have a message delivered from above to a messenger. The prophets get it from God through Gabriel, but Peter Parker's taking that photograph when the spider comes in from above and gives him his message through a bite, right? Bruce Wayne is either, you know, sitting in his bedroom and he sees the bat flying over his head. And again, a metaphor for, for Gabriel. Peter Parker, and Superman is not only sent by his parents, the new parents in his ship, very much the story of Moses on the Nile, but you hear the voice of his father saying to earth, I have sent to you my only son. Right? That's the voice of God. And the reason for that is because there's a Western conspiracy. I'm kidding, you can take a breath now. 
The reason for that is the Bible is known as the greatest story ever told, right? It's new stories based on older architecture, so it's, it's exciting, but it's also familiar. So my pitch to my investors is the only people doing this in our part of the world are the bad guys. Let me go in, get some content, secularize it, and create what became the 99. Over the past 10 years, I've been able to raise almost $40 million for this project from investors in the region, including Islamic banks, who wanted to be proactive in changing how our culture perceived itself and therefore how it's perceived by the world. Um, I, the 99 are, in theory, 99 characters from 99 different countries. There's, I say in theory because we've only done 37 of them so far. They're from Arabia, the US, Europe, they're from all over the place. They're boys and girls. The girls, some wear the hijab, some don't. One wears the full niqab. The idea is about diversity. It's not about there's one way to live your life. But we never discuss religion in the storylines at all. It's based, it's based on those values that Islam shares with the rest of humanity. And it's based on the 99 attributes of Allah in the Quran. Things like mercy and generosity and foresight, just basic, basic human values. We were able to base it on the, the backstory in 1258. According to history, the Mongols invade Baghdad, Baghdad and destroyed all the books from Dar al-Hikmah, the most famous library in his time, were thrown in the Tigris River and the, and the Tigris changed its color with ink. I rewrote that in my version. Those, th th those books that were dumped in the river and the ink did come out, but the librarians were able to save it by dipping 99 stones into the river and sucked up all that information. Those stones end up powering my characters. Now those books were not just Muslim books, they were Jewish books and Christian books and Greek philosophers because the caliph at the time had told his advisors to translate any book they can get their hand onto into Arabic in which he'd pay its weight in gold. So from the beginning, the concept, they're from 99 countries, it's based on universal truths, and it's based on values that Islam shares with humanity. We had amazing reviews from the world's press, thousands and thousands of articles that came out supporting us in our mission, which is very fortunate. Um, this led to a series that came out, uh, the comic book series came out in multiple languages, it became the first intellectual property from the Muslim world to actually go outside the bounds of Arabia. Uh, the 99 Village theme park launched in Kuwait five years ago, it's not Disneyland, but we have 300,000 visitors a year, which is, which is more than 10% of our population. And we did back-to-school products both in, in Spain and in, in Turkey. Um, our TV show is something I'm very proud of. It's out in 70 countries, from the US to China. It's out in Mandarin on, Chinese, on, on Cartoon Network. It's out in Pakistan. It's been out in our region for a couple years now. My writers are from all over the world. They're based in Hollywood. Stan Berkowitz has been trying to convince me he's Italian. I don't think so. <laughs> So, so, so the point is that the, the content is just based, you know, if you know what it is to be a good guy, then you can write for the 99. It's not about Islam. Nobody ever practices any religion within the series. Um, we did a fun series of DC Comics in which the 99 end up partnering with Batman, Superman, and a Wonder Woman who found her clothes for, after 70 years of looking. Uh, <laughs> it had to be a Gulf Arab male to pull this out, right? But she's actually wearing a jacket. She's in the desert, but she's wearing a jacket. Um, these storylines came out, they start off with distrust between the two groups of superheroes. In fact, Superman punches one of my characters in book two, and then they realize it's the bad guys from both universes, the extremists who are causing the problems, and then the 99 and Superman and Batman and the rest of them work cape to shoulder in fighting extremism. Now, this had a lot of people who, who, uh, who supported it and a lot of people who criticized DC Comics, uh, but one of the biggest support we got was from President Obama who called it the most innovative response to his Cairo speech, which was a pretty big deal for us. Um, that brought us to the attention to the world, of, of the world. And of course the world includes people who want to control what Islam and its messaging means. So I got my first fatwa <laughs> from Fox News. <laughs> Obama's Muslim and this proves it. He's trying to brainwash your kids with Sharia superheroes. Anybody watching the show will become radical and become a jihadi. And my favorite criticism was we can't let those Muslims brainwash our children like the Mexicans did with Dora the Explorer. <laughs> we laugh, but in fact, the cable TV station that bought and paid a lot of money for our show still has not aired it because of this criticism. Oh. Meanwhile, my mentor, Michael Eisner, uh, don't tell anybody back home, uh, but, <laughs> but Michael was able to pick up the phone, talk to Netflix, and had them air it for us here, uh, explain the story to them. So, you know, so we've been very fortunate that we actually came out in the U.S. on TV, but it was not, it was in spite of what happened to us, not because of it. But meanwhile, this is not, you know, the same thing happened back home. I get their regular campaigns against me on Twitter. The nice thing now is that people are actually answering back. They're having an internal discourse. It's not just about, but this last one was pretty intense. It lasted from New Year's Eve. If anybody asks you how they celebrated New Year's in Saudi this year, it was trying, you put me on trial, it was the hashtag. Uh, lasted for a month. They became competitive in terms of how I should meet my end. Uh, <laughs> Who, who said there's no creativity? Um, 
But this led to an entrepreneurial lawyer in Kuwait who has a case against me for apostasy that he submitted to the public prosecutor's office. I have not been called yet. It's been two months since uh, I've been told that the, probably the government will just shelve it and not call me for trial. But if I do, I'm sure you'll find out. Um, and that led to a very curious thing which happened two months ago, a fatwa from the Grand Mufti of Saudi. Now this is interesting for a number of reasons. It's interesting because for six years the 99 had been legal in Saudi Arabia. For two years it's been on TV airing continuously. For the last six months it's been off air because of the cyclical nature of programming and the fatwa came out now. So I don't know what's going on, but, but my, my, my wife is Saudi, my in-laws think this is, this, I did this as an excuse not to go visit. Uh, <laughs> So our, our concept is a double bottom line project, so it's about financial return, it's also about social return, and you know, the thing is that if you tell a kid enough times that they're stupid, they're going to start believing that they're stupid, and if you tell them enough times that they're a terrorist, they're going to start believing it too. So our, we were about kind of competing with the negative imagery, because media does not just reflect reality, media can create reality, and so you know, one of the things I'm proudest of is, you know, when we were able to get on the cover of an international edition of Newsweek, typically if something had to do with Islam and is on the cover of Newsweek, it's not usually very good news. And so when I juxtapose the cover of 9-11 with that, you can see that what we've done is we've come a long way. And I'm going to, I'm going to just uh, ask a question to, to wrap things up. But how many of you here have read The Catcher in the Rye? Show of hands. How many of you have killed in the name of that book? <laughs> you know, you laugh, but 34 years ago, Mark David Chapman shot and killed John Lennon with a, with a copy of that book on him and told police it was the book that drove him to kill. A year later, John Hinckley also tried to kill President Reagan. He too referred to the same book. So whose fault is that? The book or the deranged lunatic who thought the author was speaking directly to him? Thank you very much. Mankind's collective civilization crystallized in 99 stones spread across the globe. 99 young heroes from 99 countries finding each other for the first time. United, working as a single team, these youngsters can help shape the destiny of mankind. But who will guide the 99? The forces of light or the forces of darkness? One by one, in places all around the world, the stones are being found and the new stone bearers are networking. Their stones contain the wisdom of all traditions, all humanity. It's a race, but it's no game. Different cultures, different philosophies, all brought together by the timeless stones that make up the 99. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I'm about to introduce to you a remarkable woman whose name is Latifa Ibn Ziyatin. She is an example of a model of taking moral a response in the face of tragedy and suffering. Her son, Imad, an impressive, handsome, young French paratrooper was shot to death at point-blank range by a fanatic Islamist jihadist extremist by the name of Mohammed Merah. And in, within a matter of days in that year, 2012, he had slaughtered other individuals and specifically targeted the Jewish school Otsar HaTorah in this town of Toulouse, killing three children and one adult. Latifa's response was an inspiring one. She declared what most Muslims, I believe, share, that such actions are not Islam. But she went a stage further, and she said, this kind of desecration of Islam can be defeated. Paraphrasing the words of Edmund Burke, she says, all we have to do is do something and not stand by and allow evil to triumph. And she founded, she established a foundation in the name of her son 
the Imad Ibn Ziyatan Association for Youth and Peace. And this vehicle brings her to prisons, to schools, to groups across France, which unfortunately have all too often been poisoned with anti-Semitic, anti-Western viruses, and teaches them, declares to them, this is not Islam, this is not the right way. She preaches the path of humanism, of mutual respect, of religious pluralism and diversity. In doing so, she takes many risks for her own personal safety and well-being. And it is, I think, a most fitting, perhaps one of the most fitting tributes that AJC has ever made to a person for personal courage that we honor today, Latifa Ibn Ziyatin, who is truly an Eshet Chayr, a woman of valor, femme de valeur. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Latifa Ibn Ziyatin. Please be seated. Latifa will address a few words to us in response, translated by our representative in France, Simon Rodan Ben Zaken. Hello. Shalom. Bonjour. Salam alaikum. Mesdames et Messieurs, je suis très honoré de recevoir ce prix de la main de Monsieur David Rosalé. Merci beaucoup. Et merci à Simone, merci qui m'a aidé à, à venir ici parmi vous aujourd'hui. J'ai fondé cette association après l'assassinat de mon fils. Ahmed Ibn Ziyatan était parachutiste de l'air à Toulouse. Excusez-moi. Mon fils était un soldat remarquable, un soldat d'honneur. J'ai élevé mes enfants avec dignité et respect, avec toute l'éducation qu'il souhaitait. Il fallait un drame qui nous frappe et frappe toute notre famille. Et mon fils, il était assassiné par Mohamed Marrah. Il a été assassiné Dubu. Mon fils, il a refusé de se mettre à genoux parce que c'était un soldat de la République qui servait son pays et servait sa patrie. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I will try and make a, a short um, translation of what Latifa just said. I am very honored to receive this award today. First of all, I would like to thank David Rosen, to thank Simone for having brought me here. I would like to take the opportunity to thank everybody here. This recognition is important for the fight that I lead for peace between peoples and the fight against all forms of violence and hatred. I founded my organization, Imad Youth and Peace, after the death of my son in April 2012. At that time, I realized that I was not allowed to drown in my grief and that it was necessary for me to get up and to try to understand the reasons for my son's death. My son refused to, to kneel down. He died standing up as a soldier. And I have to stand up too. It is from this moment onwards that I have decided to go on and meet young people from the neighborhood where the terrorist Mohammed Mirah came from. 
to understand the cause of my suffering. I realized that those young people were in complete lack of bearings left to, uh, to, uh, left to themselves, living in social insecurity and ignorance. They made me understand the lack of education, confinement, and social violence that this youth undergo. I forgive Mohamed Merah not for what he has done, but from where he comes from. He had no love, no family, and no, social, no, no security. I wanted to understand from where, my suffering, from where my suffering came from and respond peacefully to this violence by giving testimonies about how much suffering they have caused. Today, I'm going to difficult neighborhoods to talk to those young people. I go, to st I go into schools to talk with students. I have been in juvenile prisons to generate debate with inmates. And I initiate ed educational programs on pluralism, on living together in order to find ignorance and allow them to open up to other cultures and religions. I have brought recently um, a few students, a few young students from Morocco um, to, to France and the other way around. And when those young, young students came uh, to, to France and to, to Morocco, I made them um, meet other cultures, other religion. We went, for example, into a synagogue we were supposed to stay for half an hour. We stayed at the end for an hour and a half. And when we came out, they, the students asked me questions. And I said, I don't understand. They're just like us. And I said, yes, they are indeed just like us. And this is not Islam. Islam the Islam of Mohammed Mirah is, is not the right Islam. It is, the real Islam is an Islam of, of, of love, of understanding. And we actually have a lot of similar suits. And I would just like to add something. Latifa has a project um, in the next coming month um, where she wants to bring um, those young children um, from the very difficult neighborhoods to bring them to Israel, to bring them to the Palestinian territories, to get them uh, to understand to what extent we're actually not different. Thank you very much.